how Valentine's Day developed. Pagan festivals being adopted. The same thing happened with Christianity. So, when you come back to why the Jews, Christians say Jesus was God originally, it had no doctrinal evidence, no scriptural evidence. But because it became a state-sponsored religion, they started having to find evidences and interject things into the Bible and the Gospels to make it palatable to allow Trinity. I'm not going to dwell too much on that because that would be a whole lecture in itself. The next question. How would you argue the concept of the Trinity to non-Muslims when they give arguments like morning, afternoon, and night are three separate things but one day? That's just semantics. It's just playing with words. The most common one you hear is the egg. The egg has three constituent parts, the shell, the yolk, and the white. Three things, one egg. Or the apple. The apple has the skin, the flesh, and the core. Three things, one apple. It's just language. If you actually talk and think about it, are you saying that an egg with three separate constituent parts is one thing? No, an egg has a shell, it has a white, and it has a yolk, and they are completely separate. Even if you beat it up into an omelette, it still becomes the three part, the two parts mixed together. You can't liken unity, monotheism of Allah, the unity of God, and say that it's like three things, morning, afternoon, because if it was morning, afternoon, and night, there are three constituent parts of one day. Neither has supremacy <coughs> over the other, right? But that's not the argument in Christianity. The argument in Christianity is that the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Father has supremacy over the Son. We know that. In the Bible, when Jesus was on the cross, what did he say? My Lord, why hast thou forsaken me? Rabbi, my Lord, why hast thou forsaken me? Which means he didn't have control. He wasn't in control of his destiny. Therefore, he wasn't an equal constituent part of the Trinity. He was a subservient. And every Christian would explain to you that, of course, God the Father is the one who we pray to. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, do, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Who are you asking? Our Father who art in heaven. Allahu khayru razikeen. Allah in the Quran it says, Allahu khayru razikeen. Allah is the best provider of risk. So in the same way the Christian is asking, my Lord, our Father, give us this day our daily bread. No one says, Jesus, give me my daily bread. Holy Spirit, give me my daily bread. You always turn to the Father, so the Father is supreme. Therefore, it's not three equal constituent parts. It's, it's semantics. It's just arguing with language to say, well, it's like three and one, one and three. Because believe me, the Trinity is, is a leap of faith. Any of our Christian brethren who are here, it's a leap of faith. Islam doesn't require a leap of faith because everything in Islam makes sense. Why? Because it came from Al-Hakim, the wise. <laughs> al alim the all-knowing. So he knows how he made us. So he gave us it easy to understand. One God. Neither he begets, nor is he begotten, and there is nothing like unto him. So it's just a language argument that, realistically speaking, if somebody's using that argument, then fine, have, have a discussion over it, but know in your heart that it's just language, and they're trying to baffle you with language rather than reason. Why the five messengers cited earlier more mighty to compare to the other messengers of Allah. We know regarding those five that Allah has chosen them as five each with a separate covenant from. All of the messengers we love, all of the messengers we revere, and all of the messengers we accept. But in that lineage, we also accept that those five were given a status above by Allah, and Allah only knows best why He chose them. It's His decision to choose them. And out of them, the best of all of them and the best of all of humanity was Muhammad the seal of the prophets, the imam of the prophets. He was he is the one who all of the messengers were told that if you come after him, you follow him. Isa when he comes back, will follow the Sharia of Rasulullah. When it came to Israel Miraj, and all of the Anbiya were gathered in Masjid al Aqsa in Jerusalem. Who led them in prayer? Prophet So he was chosen another degree above, the best of all of them. So it's Allah's wisdom why he chose them. Next question. 
I was asked by an atheist, this is great, I was asked by an atheist, if Islam is meant to bring peace to humanity, why is it taking such a long time for disbelievers to realize? That's a shame on us. Muslims. Everybody heard of Yusuf Islam, Cat Stevens? Yusuf Islam once said to me, he said, you know when I first came into Islam, I thank Allah, I shukr to Allah every day, that I learned about Islam before I met Muslims. And I'm embarrassed. I said, why? He said, because if I met the Muslims first, I don't know if I'd have bothered reading about it. Why is it taking such a long time to show the beauty of the message of Islam? Because we are not practicing Islam as it's meant to be practiced. In a lecture I gave to a humanist society, I was just mentioning to some brothers earlier, all they were shocked by is, you're giving us this picture of Islam, we don't see it anywhere in the world. And I can't turn around and say, well actually yes, it's prevalent in every Muslim country, because it's not. Because we've drifted from the Quran and the Sunnah. We've left our deen behind us and adopted isms. Communism, capitalism, Bengaliism, Pakistaniism, Saudiism, whatever isms. Nationalism, Hizbiya and Asabiya. We've adopted them instead of the Quran and Sunnah as our constitution. This is the problem. So why is it taking such a long time? In the time of Rasulullah, people would take Shahada just seeing him. Seeing him, they took Shahada. They didn't hear the message. They saw the man's character and they came into the fold of Al Islam. After Fatah Makkah, what happened? Thousands of people came flooding into Islam, meeting the companions, seeing their example, seeing the message in its purity. They came flying into Islam. Now, when we have internet and TV and globalization and Islam is everywhere, People are running away from Islam. Why? Because of us. And I point the finger first at me before anyone else. We are not who we are meant to be. So we do not portray the beauty of Islam. <laughs> My heart breaks because I have a lot of contact with non-Muslims. Obviously I work for the government. I was meeting with some senior government lawyers once and they were giving me some advice. So listen, if you're ever going to do business, make sure you don't do business with Muslims. They said, why? They said, because they're all liars and cheats. Imagine, what do I say to that? I said, I, all I can do is tell the truth. Islam teaches us to be honest and have integrity in our dealings. Islam teaches us to be the best of people, the best of characters. But Rasulullah said, I have not been sent except to perfect good character, good manners, adab and akhlaq. So we are not following the message. It's the old adage, if you drive a Ferrari into a wall, you don't blame the Ferrari, blame the driver. Us Muslims, we're not driving the car of Islam properly right now. And that's why people are flooding into Islam. That's why it's taking a long time for people to come to Islam, because we are not exhibiting the character of a Muslim. And again, I refer on Sunday, if anyone has time, the character of a Muslim will be discussed in Newport, shall we? Okay, the next question. Jesus, peace be upon him, is not dead yet. Allah has taken care of him. So who, so who's the one being killed to replace Jesus? I can only say I don't know. I really don't. The scholars had debate and conjecture over who it was. Some of the ulama of al Islam have said that perhaps it was um, what's the name of the uh, traitor? Judas. Judas Iscariot. Some some scholars say that Judas Iscariot. But it's one of those questions that we don't, it's interesting, but it's not of any consequence to us. So the simplest answer is, I don't know. Allah knows best. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. And this is just a, a word of advice to our, our young Muslim brethren. When somebody asks you a question you don't know, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Because it's better to say, I don't know, I'll try and find out, than to make a mistake. A man came to Imam Malik once, and he asked 33 questions. 31 of those 33, the answer was, I don't know. This is Imam Malik. If Malik doesn't know, who's going to know? But he wasn't going to take a chance. A man came to uh, Imam Abu Hanifa Rahmallah one time and he said that I was suddenly asking you questions, random questions, like we get today. You know, how many times you heard that if I'm praying on the moon, which direction do I face? When are you going to get over to the moon? <laughs> I 